Good evening. evening. Welcome to our service this evening. I'm Pastor James Grabitsky from St. Paul's and Trinity Lutheran Churches in Montrose and Crawford Lake. We'll use the order for our service that is printed out for us in our bulletin and on our screens. We'll open our service this evening with our first hymn, His, His Robes for Mine.
please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you in our thoughts, in our words, in our deeds, and in all that we have not done. Forgive us in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Deliver and restore us that we may rest in peace. By the mercy of God, we are redeemed by Jesus Christ, and in him we are forgiven. Let us rest in his peace until the rising of the sun, when we shall serve him in newness of life. Amen. We read Psalm 4. Psalm 4, answer me when I call to you, my righteous God. Give me relief from my distress. Be merciful to me and hear my prayer. Tremble and do not sin. You are on your beds. Search your hearts and be silent. Offer the sacrifices of the righteous and trust in the Lord. Many, Lord, are asking, who will bring us prosperity? Let the light of your face shine on us. In peace I will lie down and sleep. For you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. We pray. Grant peace to your people, Lord, that amid the stresses of life, we may rest quietly, knowing all is right with you, since your Son has paid for every sin, defeated every enemy, and rules at the right hand of your throne in heaven. Let us fall asleep each night in peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Passion history. Uh, the scripture reading tonight call, is called the, the Passion History Reading. Unlike the ordinary meaning of the word passion, the meaning of this word as it applies to the series of readings during Lent is based on the ancient original Latin and Greek, Passio or Pascha, meaning suffering or as reflected in a contemporary word, compassion. So we read a history from suffering and death of our Lord. The readings this year are from the book of Mark. Tonight's reading is Mark 14, 1 to 26, presented in video format on our screens. Now the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread were only two days away, and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for some sly way to arrest Jesus and kill him. But not during the feast, they said, or the people may riot. While he was in Bethany, reclining at the table, in the home of a man known as Simon the Leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, and you can help them any time you want. But you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. I tell you the truth. Wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money. So he watched for an opportunity to hand him over. On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, Where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples, telling them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Say to the owner of the house he enters, the teacher asks, Where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. The disciples left, went into the city, and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. While they were reclining at the table eating, he said, 
I tell you the truth. One of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They were saddened, and one by one they said to him, Surely not I. It is one of the twelve, he replied, one who dips bread into the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him, but woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it. This is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them. And they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. He said to them, I tell you the truth. I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. We join in our next hymn, hymn number, hymn number 407, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. God, our Heavenly Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The word of God before us this evening is, our, is from Luke chapter 23, verses 26 through 34. So they led him away. They seized Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country. They placed the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large crowd of people was following him, including women who were mourning and wailing for him. 
Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, stop weeping for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. Be sure of this, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the, ch the childless women, the wombs that never gave birth, and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things to the green wood, what will happen to the dry? Two other men who were criminals were led away with Jesus to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. They cast lots to divide his garments among them. This is the word of our God. Beloved in the Lord, imagine it. Nobody had sympathy for the man. He was accused of a heinous crime, something so gruesome, so repulsive. Society had turned its back on him. Everyone was certain of his guilt. The prosecutor had stood before the court condemning the man. The jury had convicted him. No one had any sympathy for him. The news reports were all the same, condemning what had happened, feeling for the victims of the crime, and everyone thought it was all done. But time passed. There were some cooler heads who looked at the case much later. They realized mistakes were made. They realized that in the passion of the moment, they had condemned an innocent man and he was languishing in prison. He had protested his innocence all this time and nobody would listen. These students of law took to the man's case and they decided they were going to use every avenue they could to get the court to overturn that conviction. And when people heard about that case, the man that they had no sympathy for, they had sympathy for him. How could they have gotten it so wrong? The prosecutor himself stood up and apologized and called for him to be released. The judge vacated the sentence he was released. The news reports had all changed, and everyone felt sorry for the man. They had sympathy. This could be any number of news uh, that takes place. Watch the news long enough and you might think it ha just happened. Or you could remember a case where it happened long ago. Or we could experience it even now. Perpetual cycle. Someone is accused, we are convinced of their guilt, we will not stand for what they have done, and then we we'll want to lock them up only to find out much later, we got the wrong guy. What do you do? You kind of find the same thing happening with our Lord's passion. The passions of the people run hot and they condemn him and they will not have any sympathy for him. But as they leave town on the way to the skull, and they find that he cannot carry the cross anymore, things begin to turn. They see Simon, they put the cross on him. He has to carry the cross, and as he's going, people are realizing this guy's not guilty. And it's all too late. Women were mourning for him. They had utter sympathy for him, only to hear, hear our Lord turn to them and say, you have sympathy for the wrong person. Don't weep for me. Weep for yourselves. Jesus was a condemned man. And it's not that he didn't want sympathy, but he wanted sympathy to be placed in the right and proper place. Sympathy for him really exhibited what we are sorrowful over, namely that here an innocent man is being accused and he is being led away to his death and he's going to be crucified. 
But in all this, Jesus wants to redirect our sympathy. Think about it. God is on trial. And God redirects our focus from the trial to ourselves. He wants the sympathy pointed at us so that we would understand. So many times people look at the passion of the Christ and they feel so sorrowful over what the Savior went through. But they don't take it to the next step. Jesus takes it to the next step when he turns to the women and he says to them, daughters of Jerusalem, stop weeping for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. Here Jesus is about to be crucified. And our Savior's heart is for the people who are around him. You think about what they have done. They have put God on trial they put him through the one trial after another, and Jesus has become what we would call not sympathetic, but pathetic. He's been led from one trial to another, from the high priest, Pilate, to Herod, back to Pilate, and now through all the mockings, the scourgings, the beatings, and everything, he is not even capable of carrying his own cross of course, hearts go out to him. But Jesus wants to grab our attention one more time. To have us redirect that sympathy so that him to understand that sympathy needs to be towards us. He says, weep for yourselves and for your children. He tells them, to be sure of this, the days are coming when they will say, blessed are the childless women, the wombs that never gave birth, the breasts that never nursed. And they'll say to the mountains, fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. Our Lord is acting in part as prophet. He knows what's coming. The people of Jerusalem here have God's promised Savior in their midst. And what do they do? They put Him on trial and they condemn Him for crimes He did not commit. They condemn Him for being the Son of God, the promised Messiah. And they sentence Him to death. And the Lord says, you need the sympathy. It's because of what they have done. They have rejected the Christ and now they have set the ball rolling and they will now have to face that same rejected Christ on the last day, on the day of judgment. And that day is coming much sooner than they think. Jesus points them ahead to the time of 70 A.D. when God will have Jerusalem surrounded by the Roman soldiers. And the times will be so bad that they will cry out to the mountains and the hills to fall on them, to cover them, to smother them so that they don't live. They'll actually think it is a wonderful blessing for women to be childless that the absence of children is a blessing rather than a blessing to have them. Everything will be topsy-turvy. How sorrowful that state will be. But Jesus is not just warning about the coming destruction of Jerusalem. He's warning about that coming destruction that is to befall all mankind because of sin. See, the crime that was committed was not Christ. The crime that was committed was ours. We are the ones who have committed the crime against God. We have sinned against Him. We deserve to be on trial, not God. We deserve to be condemned, not God. The guilt is ours. The guilt belongs to us. The evidence is overwhelming. We should be condemned and thrown out of God's presence forever. But God had sympathy on us. 
God had sympathy on us when He sent His own Son into our world to bear our humanity for us. To take our sins upon Himself. To go to the cross. To be nailed to that cross for us. To die for our sins. So that through Christ we would have pardon. And peace. So that in Christ Jesus we would find our release. That God would give us His justice. Not by forgetting about our sins, but by having punished our sins in Christ. And taking away our guilt in Jesus so that now we, we can stand before God. What, I, what irony is here? The world wants to put God on trial. Condemn God for not being fair, not being just, and here God turns things around. The world does not have sympathy for God, but God does have sympathy for the world. He sent His Son for everyone to redeem them all. And just when you think it can't get any more blessed, they take our Savior and they nail Him to the cross. The Lord Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Our Savior asks the Heavenly Father to forgive the soldiers, to forgive those who have condemned Him, to forgive those who have put Him on trial, to forgive everyone. But they didn't understand it. The world does not have sympathy. God does. God sees us in our pathetic and pitiful state and He sends his, has sent His Son to buy us back, to redeem us, to be His very own. Think about the whole concept of putting God on trial. In Jesus' passion, the world actually did it. They did it, and in order to condemn him, they had to, to lie and to cheat and to present false witnesses. And the only thing that they could find to condemn him for was being him. Being the very Son of God. He was killed because of who he was. But God had sent him to the cross for us and for our redemption. So in that cross, instead of seeing someone whom we have sympathy for, we see someone who has had sympathy for us. We see our Redeemer. We see our Savior. We see someone who is still the symbol of sympathy for this world. The one who died for all. That all who look to Him would live. We see Jesus. Amen. The peace of God that surpasses all understanding may guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We now receive our offerings. Please rise. We pray. Abide with us, Lord, for it is evening, and the day is almost over. Abide with us and with your whole church. Abide with us in the evening of the day, in the evening of life, in the evening of the world. Abide with us in your grace and goodness, in your holy word and sacrament, in your comfort and blessing. Abide with us when we are overcome by the night of sorrow and fear. 
by the night of doubt and affliction, by the night of bitter death. Abide with us and with all your people in time and in eternity. Amen. We pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine on us. May God bless us still, so that all the ends of the earth will fear him. Please be seated. We close with our, our with our closing him, uh, may the peace of God, our Heavenly Father, in 929. Good evening to all of you. It's good to be with you this evening. It's uh, always fun, these Lent uh, series, to uh, slide through all the various churches, uh, although I get here more often, because um, sometimes, I, well, Pastor Margaret used to have me come preach for him on Mondays once in a while, and still, every now and then, El Elke has also, Pastor Elke has also asked me once so far. I, he, they didn't give me any announcements, so I have nothing more for you. Uh, God's blessings to you throughout your week and throughout our, our passion history through Lent as we, as we watch our Savior, as we enjoy ourselves uh, to Him 
and rejoice in the redemption that he has procured for us. 